Welcome to The Swing of Things with Amanda Krauss, a brand new podcast hosted by me, Amanda Krauss, and produced with Row 360. We're going to talk a little bit about rowing and a lot about other things. In this episode, U.S. Rowing's London 2012 Olympian Sarah Hendershot meets Josie Verdonscott, our new Chief High Performance Officer. Last summer, despite being sequestered in a COVID isolation hotel for a good part of the Olympics, Josie led the Dutch national team women to three Olympic medals at Tokyo 2020. He is known as an innovative and forward-thinking coach with an athlete-centered approach to high-performance rowing. So without further ado, I shall pass the mic to guest host, Sarah. Welcome, Yossi, to the U.S. Rowing Podcast. I'm so excited to have you here today. Thanks. It's great being there. Yeah, we are all very excited to have you joining the U.S. Rowing community. I'm excited for the U.S. Rowing community to hear from you, to learn a little bit about who you are and your experiences and what you hope to bring to our system. So I thought maybe we could just start with a really simple question of how did you get involved in rowing in the first place? I'm your typical walk-on. I went to university and I come from the part in the Netherlands, the only part where there's kind of hills. So that's the only place where you can't row. And I went uh, on and studied in Amsterdam. And in Amsterdam, there's a nice rowing club called Neerhuis. And we got some friends. So I, I went there basically because they had the best parties. And I ended up in a freshman's eight, and that's how I got caught with, uh, within the system. That's funny. So were you dragged to the boathouse by a roommate or s- something of that sort? I yeah. think that's a similar, a common walk-on story. Yeah, just by a classmate. And he said, okay, come over. He put me in a tub, you know, large boat. And he told me I was great, which after some time, you know, my, my, my blade getting caught and I, you know, almost getting catapulted out of the boat. I didn't have the idea that what that it was that great, but at least he was enthusiastic and I made it to the freshman's age, so I was happy. Yeah, so what was that experience like then as an athlete? What were the, the highlights for you and what really kept you coming back to the sport? In the Netherlands, rowing is a little bit different. We have uh, colleges, so most of the important rowing clubs are connected to the university, but it's not really like uh, part of the of the program, it, more or less, it's a social club outside the university, and but it is a way of meeting people, having a good time, and you know do some sports when you're studying. And I got caught. I, I so I was in freshman's eight, and like many people, I tried to stick on to to hang on to rowing as long as possible. So in the end, I had an international experience. I I rode in Lucerne. Uh, as a lightweight, by the way. And uh, in the Netherlands, because the colleges are connected to the boat, uh, to the clubs, but not funding, it's more or less normal that when you when you row for so many years and there were always coaches and there's always a board and there's always people helping, helping you, it's kind of natural that once you start having a job, etc., that you start coaching or at least be a member of the board for one year and then you start coaching. And so basically I was pursuing a professional career and on the side coaching almost full time. And in that way, you know, you give back to your club, which was great. And since I think 87, I coached at my club. I had my first experience. I went to the under 23s two or three times with the club boat. So like in your system by selections or by trials, and we went uh, to the under 23s and in that way i you know i got caught up a little bit in the in the national system and many years later <laughs> i'm here yeah that's that's an interesting uh entry into coaching but now you've been in it for such a long time and you have an incredible fantastic coaching track record right so um maybe you can tell the audience a little bit about what some of your uh, highlights really have been as a coach, right? You've you've coached for multiple nations and you have raced all different kinds of races with your athletes. So w- what has meant the most to you and what really stands out? Yeah, it's always difficult as a coach to tell what, what, what has meant most to you because sometimes uh, an achievement that isn't, you know, the goal that the Olympics 
means more to you than uh, than that what what the audience really thinks are the great things. But in my case, you know, I've coached in in uh, Italy, I've coached in Belgium uh, for the national teams, I've coached in the Netherlands, and what what is most important to me is really feeling that together you find a way to make it work. So, for instance, when I arrived in Italy, uh, it was classical. I worked in Italy, uh, uh, the Olympic cycle building up to, uh, to London, uh, 2009 to 2012. And, well, basically, in Italy, it's like this. I was head coach women. Huh? Women, girls, are supposed to row. That's good for them until they finish high school. Because after high school, you've got three options. One would be study, one would be marry, and three would be finding a job. But all three, according to Italian standards, are not compatible with sports. So my challenge was to try and build a group and keep, you know, keep them in the sports in a way that they could combine a relationship or they could combine studying with rowing or having a job. And my first year, um, I went to the Worlds with only a quad and a single, a lightweight single scholar. And up till that moment was 2009, Italy had only medaled twice, two times a bronze medal uh, in the entire history of world championships. And in my first year, my lightweight single, she got a silver. And my quad just missed out and got the fourth place. So it was the best result ever. So for me, it's like really creating something and it might not have the, the glamour that some people have. But for me, it was really important to, to see that as a group, they, they evolved and, you know, that we did together. So experience like that is really what... What makes me happy. Yeah, you know, I've learned that about you already in the short period of time that I've known you, which is only less than a month, really, at this point, um, that you are a builder, right? You really enjoy the process of building. Um, and it sounds like that experience in particular was really special to you because you were you were building something from really not a whole lot. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, I like I like to build. I've got one son. He likes to build as well, but basically with Lego and with uh, <laughs> games like that. No, but to me, it's important that you put together a system that is sustainable, where people feel welcome and uh, that really helps people uh, to be engaged in sports, but also be engaged in life. But let's, let's be honest, um, sports is totally important for a part of your life, but at a certain point, you have to carry on. So we have to realize as coaches that, that we are just for one part of somebody's uh, life, we are having a contribution. And in that part, we, you know, we can be very efficient. Um, so we can do select, 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 and just pick some really nice cherries. But for the rest, we, we are not involved. Or you can just look at it and see how how you, you are able to build a system that is clear to everybody and where you have um, people who enjoy staying in there for a longer time. Because like I, I said uh, in another discussion today, um, finding talents is very difficult. It's a specialty, but keeping talents is even more a specialty because the importance of retaining athletes and the importance not only athletes, eh, also of retaining coaches and staff is, is sometimes hugely underestimated because mm -hmm. if you've got an experienced coach, you should be able for the coach to integrate it with, your, with, you know, uh, with his family, with his life, because you want to keep him. If you've got a staff member, yeah, you can have him work 60 hours a, day, uh, a week, but maybe it's better if he only works like 55 which is normal and then he would be able to keep his joy in his in his job etc so for me it's like building a team so it's not the system that i want to build eh? it's the team 
I can design a system. Uh, that's really special. And I think it's uh, I, something I'm really excited to see you bring to our system is this appreciation of the individual and this understanding that sometimes you need to meet that individual where they are or help them to figure out how to make a situation work for them. So where did that come from with you? Like, was there another coach that you learned from that helped to teach you some of those those processes? Or it almost sounds like you have a psychology background. <laughs> you have, don't you? I do. <laughs> I don't have a psychology background, but I um, I like puzzles. I like challenges. I like make something work where other people think it will not work. And that's, you know, creativity is important, but I think... I apply basic rules. That's just, um, I try to be analytic. I, I try to, to use whatever means I have to analyze the system instead of just going through the motions. Because to be honest, my results are based not upon the right people, but about being clever, how these people can, uh, you know, can get to the level where, uh, where they came. In 2016, my lightweight double women, they won the gold in, the, in Rio. One year before, they, were, they weren't qualified. And four months before the final qualifier in Lucerne, um, one girl fell off her bike and she broke a rib. Not like a stress fracture, but she broke a rib. So she was back in the boat three weeks before the Olympic qualification. Wow, I did not know that story. Yeah. It's not about um, despair. It's just about, okay, so we have a setback. And the only question I ask a rower before the race is, do you think that you did everything you could have done? The answer should be yes. So you get what you deserve. So if somebody has to sit on a bike for six weeks before the first race, which was the Europeans, you know, yeah, it will be a bit, a bit rusty. But if you have to sit on a bike... Just make sure that you sit on the bike in the right way, do your training, and it will, you know, you are training. So don't think what you didn't do. We don't, if people talk about funding or talk about, uh, I don't know, time, whatever, people always explain what they can't do. But it's not interesting what you can't do. The word not has no meaning. It's only about what you can do. So if you make a plan, if I make a plan with an individual, don't misunderstand me. The level and uh, so what the demands will stay the same. It's not that just because you're in school, it's okay that you do like, uh, you get a different standard. The standard is the same, but I will help you to, to make the best out of the time that you have at your disposition. What you can use, try and do what you can do in that time and avoid the word trying as well. Do what you can do so you will get what you deserve, simple theory. And so anal analysis helps in looking at each person just to see how you can work another puzzle. So you've got compulsory things in your, in, you know, in your school, right? So probably you can't train at that time. Will it help me if you would train or you do residencies? I have got many med school uh, uh, athletes you do residencies. Okay, so you're in the hospital between 8 and 6. Don't try to do two sessions a day. You know, we make a schedule that fits into your schedule. And okay, I might tell you on the two free days that you have, you do three sessions of 30K, but it doesn't help because you will be, you know, you will be overreaching. So just be clever. And being clever means being analytic. And being analytic means that uh, that you try to see and you find solutions instead of finding trouble. Yeah, so I want to know more about some of these specific stories that you've mentioned because that Rio story in particular is incredible. Uh, you know, in the in the first place to have a boat that has to go through that last chance qualifier to the, come out of that, qualify the boat and then to win gold, that by itself is absolutely incredible. But to have done that with a massive injury right before having to go to that qualifier, I haven't heard of a story that crazy. So what was it that worked to, to get that the most out of the situation that you could with, with that, you know, rower in particular? Well, 
the rower was Maike Head. Uh, she was a med student. Uh, she was uh, she finished off uh, her internships or her residencies uh, right before the Worlds in 2015. That's why they didn't qualify. But I was pretty sure that it was a you know a metal level boat. So we made a plan. They had great erg scores in February, and then in uh, in March uh, she fell off her bike, and it was like five six weeks before the um, before the Olympic uh, no before the European Championships, and nine weeks before uh, the qualifying. So, but for Dutch Olympic Committee, it isn't enough that you just win the qualifiers. We also had to have a World Cup result. We had to be top three. So luckily, I had a spare. And I put the spare in the boat with the bow girl, Ilse Paulus, and uh, she was good enough. So we worked on the double, and they, they were third in World Cup uh, Varese, which was just enough to be qualified for the qualifi qualification. In the meanwhile, I set Maike up in a, in a situation where she was training. She was doing uh, endurance training on the bike. She was doing dyno, one of my favorite instruments. It's a pity that uh, Concept 2 doesn't deliver those anymore, but I will come over to Vermont and try to talk to them. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah, good. Eh? And then uh, we also uh, integrated um, uh, uh, altitude training. So I set up an altitude uh, uh, training unit uh, to, to make a do hypoxic training um, in a room. So you make a room and you can sit on a bike in a room. And in that way, I integrated because the only thing I could do was an endurance block. The only thing I could do was work the lower body. So I tried to find every solution that I had. I gave her a decent schedule. And once she was over her injury, we had about seven, eight days to prepare before they had to do their first race. And the first race was the European Championships in, in, in Germany, and we won. And from there on, and that's the funny part, they never lost a race until the Olympic final. Well, I imagine that first race... Nice story. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, thinking from the athlete's perspective too, if you're able to pull off a win like that, that has to be a massive confidence builder as well. So it's almost... To be able to think yeah. to yourself, I've I've overcome all of these other obstacles. I can absolutely continue to to press forward and to win these upcoming races. Yeah, sure. And you know, um, the best part of this story is, and I'm trying to remember um, uh, the saying. It is attributed to uh, to Churchill, but it is um, um, a kite only flies high if it got if it's got a uh, headwind, something like that. So you will not achieve something without a setback. And sometimes you've got those wisdoms and they write them down on a little tile. So one day after the, after the mishap, the other girl sent this to us. Yep. So it was meant to be a little bit having that setback. That's exciting. So can you yeah. then, I know there are some stories you have um, leading up to the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like? Because, you know, COVID was challenging for every nation, and I'm sure that was just another variable that you had to work around. But what did that Tokyo preparation look like for you and for the team? And how did you handle some of those challenges? Well, um, as, you, as you might know, it, it, it was a difficult situation for everybody. First off, um, we came straight from, uh, from a training camp in Spain. We, we, we landed in the Netherlands and we would resume uh, training in the Netherlands. We did one ERG test and I made a plan where we would select the boats in April and that would be the Olympic boats. But that day that we arrived back, there was already the rumor that uh, everything was going in the wrong direction. So basically, after three, four days, everybody was grounded. So step one, make a plan. So what we did is we provided each and every individual athlete with uh, an ERG and or a kind of ERG bike, with, no, something where you can put your bike in so they could train. Then second, you, they were not supposed to have contact. So what we organized is we did the groceries. So we went out, we made a plan and we distributed every week twice a package with all they needed. So they could go for a walk, but they weren't, for them it wasn't necessary 
to go out and go shopping. We distributed weight equipment to them, small items, and we provided a special program for that. And basically, I said, okay, well, good. So we're back to basics. We do now a six-week basic block. So everybody enjoy. See you in six weeks. And they worked for six weeks. Then we were allowed to come back in small boats. We had zero uh, positive cases in our team. And basically, we kept it like that, uh, except for one girl who was after she was uh, not selected for uh, for a boat in Tokyo, but we had no positive cases over the entire period. So what we did after that, they came back and I said, okay, so for now we know Olympics might be, but not a big chance. So what we do now is we do a build block. We build up six weeks. And in that period, we will know what will happen. Whether we have Olympics or not, we will select the boats. So what I did, because, hey, you d- you have to have a target. So you try to set a target for for short periods. So we uh, we did um, four weeks of training, a build-up, and then two weeks of selection. And we selected the, the qualified boats for the Olympics. So in July, they were selected. I sent them off, two weeks biking, wherever they wanted. And then they came back. And by that time, we knew that there would be European Championships. And we so we prepared European Championships and we won everything. We won the quad, we won the straight four, we won the, uh, the light double. Uh, so it was an amazing result. And most probably because we had a very structured approach from, from the beginning to, uh, to the Europeans in, the, I think, beginning of October. There was only one thing that I said. Everybody, you are selected, but there are three criteria. It can be that somebody is will be uh, injured over a longer span of period. If there's a risk that he won't come back, that might be a reason to open the selection. Two, if the boat doesn't perform at the next important step, that would be Europeans in Varese in 2021, that might be a reason to open up the boat. And three, if one person consistently underperforms, in tests, that might be a reason, but nothing like that happened. So, in a way, by giving them security, they, you know, out of that certainty, out of the knowledge that they knew that they were not trying to get selected, but they were competing for a medal, I think they had a very focused preparation. And in a way, we didn't notice all that trouble about uh, COVID. A lot of that's very interesting uh, to me because it's very different than what happened to the team in the US. How abnormal was that kind of an early selection uh, for those women? Because I, I know just having heard you talk about some of your team building philosophy that you do really believe in building a core team and trying to retain that team over time and not starting from scratch every year, right? So how different was that than previous years, having a team that pretty much was set a year in advance and then just giving them the opportunity to continue to perform? Yeah, you can say in a way it's challenging because your span of concentration is uh, is in- impaired by a period that long. So it's difficult. So you have to set in, uh, intermediate goals. You have to have really um, a plan where, where you say, okay, this is where we are. This is where we want to perform. This is where we don't, we are, where we're not going to perform. And in a way, we still had, you know, um, there were people that weren't qualified, but in a way, that wasn't the top of my group. So I opened up selection for all non-qualified boats. That's, you know, so there was room for, for, uh, for new entries. And, and that group is, you know, is still there. We retained them all because we opened up the group and we said that you're going, you're going to be the Paris group. You need to have goals, short, uh, short term, long term, but also, uh, people need, uh, incentives in a way not to sit back. So you have to have a challenging, uh, program, but, also to feel confidence in the things we are doing. And I think pretty much all my athletes uh, felt confident when they went to, uh, uh, to Tokyo. And I can tell you, I'm not satisfied with the results. Really? We had three medals. Three medals 
was my prediction. And in total, with the men, we had five medals, which is a great result as, an, as a small nation. But the medal count is not interesting. Actually, you should look at each and every crew individually because a medal count is like statistics. Statistics are never right. You know, it's an average, but we don't look at averages. We look at peaks and we look at failures. My, my double, heavy double, okay. I predicted they would be third and they were third. And I think they did a really good job and I'm proud. My straight four should have had a little bit more confidence that they could have won. The challenge, and in the end, is two tenths. But if you look at the race, they weren't challenging the last 200 meters. Speed was even. My quad, they should have medaled. It was, there's another story that we will tell later, but um, that was not their race. And I'm not used of my crews not doing their race at, at the final moment w when it counts. And my light double, I accept, because they were the best. There was a mess-up two stroke before the finish, but they showed in that race that they were the best. So that bronze, I accept, because it's sports. You have mishaps, but they were totally prepared. But my quarter, my straight four, I'm not satisfied. There was a little extra complication in the situation. Yeah, talk about that for us. Um, <laughs> the little complication was that although nobody of us tested positive until we arrived in Tokyo, as soon as we arrived in Tokyo, um, after a few days, one person out of our out of the national team, the Dutch team, tested positive, and another person tested positive, and another person tested positive, and they were all in the same flight. So it most probably was connected to the flight we had. And then one person of the rowing team tested positive. That was number four, and an athlete, the single scuttle, tested positive. And then one of the coaches, being me, tested positive. So I was on the course until the, uh, the heats on Sunday. And then uh, on Sunday evening, I was transported to the Corona Hotel in the, in the, in the Olympic Village. And uh, I, I was uh, retested again. And uh, then I was brought to a separate hotel, a kind of an isolation place. So I was totally detached from my athletes, which is not a problem because one of my philosophies is you're ready. It's not me, eh? you're going to do it. Did you do it with you? Okay, so you will get what you, etc. So that was me. And then the races were postponed. And we had two days, no races. And then my assistant coach also tested positive. And she also came to the hotel. And my assistant coach, we, we have a team. We were there with the four or five coaches. Uh, I was mainly... Uh, responsible for the for the uh, for the light double straight four quad. Uh, my assistant was uh, responsible for the double. Uh, so my sweep coaches were still there, but there were no more sculling coaches. And we brought three sculling boats to the semi-final and the final. So the day that they raced, there was nobody of us. There was only the sweep coaches. Yeah. So how did your athletes respond to that? Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> Two things. They responded great. That's one thing to say. But there was one thing that, that, okay, everybody tells me you did everything possible. And if you even can get it, we, but one thing that I couldn't change is that I, from that moment on, had only one fear that one of my athletes would test positive. Yeah. And you can imagine their state of mind at the moment when my assistant also went away. There was nobody they could go to. Every evening around midnight, the test results would be delivered. So everybody couldn't catch their sleep until midnight, until they got a message, okay, tomorrow you can race. There was so much anxiety around that, yeah. yeah. So they performed great. And I didn't sleep very well. And there was only one thing that I regret, because, you know, as a coach, many people like to shout. I don't shout. Uh, I, I watch the race. If it's a heat or a rep or a semi-final, be, because you can still learn something. But the final, you just watch. But there's one moment after the final that's important when they come back in the dock. And it's important not for the people who win. Because, you know, when you win, you've got many friends. But it's important to be there, in this case for my quad, 
or my light double. And that, that was the hurting part. For the rest, you know, I was in a hotel, had fun with an American guy, uh, Sam Kendricks. He was the pole vaulter. He also tested positive. He brought us coffee every morning. We were not allowed to, uh, to, to mingle, etc. But I set up more or less a, a ritual for breakfast, for lunch and for dinner. We had fun together. You know, you, when you test, you get a kind of a value. So we made a, 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 a ranking of who was the, the most positive of, <laughs> of all, you know, and I rewarded cookies to those people, things like that, because, you know, you're there. So you, and with my athletes, I could speak because we could zoom. We could, so before, not a problem, but I couldn't give them all the peace of mind as I would have wanted. But in the end, I'm not pulling. So. I must be confident that all my stories I always tell, it's not me, it's you, that all the stories are true. So in a way, it was the, the proof of the pudding, whether I was right or not. And in fact, they delivered. So that's great. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's such a unique games. There's not going to be any games, I think, that that compares to Tokyo. Um, but you sound like you did a really phenomenal job at empowering your women to take their destiny into their own hands and really control what they could control. Correct. And that's what they should do. And that's what we should teach. And it's not only the women. Eh? I always did. Uh, I think our, our men did a great job. They did have their coaches, but it's a difficult situation. But it's like this. You can't change uh, the environment. You shouldn't adapt, but you should do whatever you can under the, those conditions. And, you know, sometimes... In, in Beijing, I was coaching uh, my light double, who, by the way, also won the Olympic gold, also after qualifying uh, at the uh, last qualifier, because it must be a tradition. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in 2024, I predict that I win a gold in a boat who comes through the qualification. But anyway, um, I was coaching also the Belgian guys. Uh, I was coaching men's single skull and a uh, double. My single skull, Tim Mayans, he's, he's a small guy. He's... Uh, about, uh, you would say, six foot and a bit and uh, 85 kilos. So 85, you do the mat. That's rather light, 82, 83 more or less kilos. So, and he had a really tough semi-final. And uh, we made a plan, you know. One of his opponents was uh, Marcel Hacker. And he also had uh, Tufte and Drysdale in his semi-final, I think. We focused on Hacker. And I said, you know, Hakka, you know, he's better than you are, but, you know, you can break him. It's very simple. You race because I cannot tell you to go out fast, etc., because it never works. You know, you go out fast. You know, somewhere you, no, it doesn't work like that. But what we do, you just draw a decent race, try and, try and stay in contact. And then at 1400, we start poker. So at 1400, he went. Yeah, he was overreaching. But Hacker thought that he was faster. So Hacker resigned. He resignated. And Tim got into the finals. And in the end, he came, he came in just behind Mahi with the fourth place. So actually, he got more than he deserved. But that's because the other guy didn't take what he deserved. The other guy let, you know, the, the environment um, influence himself. And that's, that's stupid. You shouldn't do that like, like that way. You know? Yeah, it's another example of controlling what you can control. I was racing in handy with an under-23 straight four. And there were two American fours. One all-star four with uh, people that were uh, having an uh, internship with, uh, um, with EY, I think. I'm not sure about that. And there was one boat. And I think Vicky Opitz was in it and some other people. And, you know, and I had... Four kids, under 23, never rode together because one girl was a junior. She, she was a scholar and she wanted to do the corner click, which is Rugata a week before. There was uh, an under 23 pair. One, one girl broke seven minutes for the first time in her life that year. And the other girl was decent. And there was a nice bow who until now still has difficulties breaking seven minutes. But they were in flow. Nice rowing. And we, we, we drew the... The, the faster American boat, I think they, they were rowing under Vesper. I'm not sure. And we drew them in the semi-final. And we knew it was going to be tough. So I told the girls, it's very simple. It's handy. 
Everybody thinks that you have to go out and lead, but just hang in, just hang in, just hang in, just on rhythm. Don't, don't exaggerate, just stay in touch, stay in touch, stay in touch. And then we get at 40s and then we commit. And once, once you commit, don't look back. When they're too fast, they will have been gone before, you have no chance. But if you can hang in, commit, don't look back and go. They committed. The Americans couldn't raise our stroke rate and we went through them. They just did whatever they needed to do and they did exactly they exactly did what they could do. And in this case, it was enough. And might been that the other people underestimated them and I don't know, but it doesn't matter because that's we leave that to the others. What we do is just what we can do. But it might be stupid, but everybody who comes to me and Sorry that I say this on a podcast, but everybody who comes to me and says, okay, and we have to go 110%. I always say, forget it. If you get up to 100, that's the max, 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 which you will ever do in your life. Most probably you will not, but that's what you aim for. Just do what you can. I do not believe that people in certain situations will, if you have never show the potential, you will not be able to do that. So I miss, must give you the confidence that you, you, will, you will reach your potential. And you don't have to be, be afraid because I don't ask something special. I just ask, do what you can do. Yeah, so you have a, a lot of great lessons to bring with you here to the States. And really, you'll be filling a, a different role than you've ever filled before. So what drew you to this role as the U.S. Rowing Chief High Performance Officer? Like, What really is appealing to you about it? Um, I think there's, I, I can tell many stories. There's one, one thing is rowing in the United States is really impressive. If you look at um, the depth of the college programs, if you look at the history of many clubs, U.S. Rowing is still leading the Olympic uh, all-time medal tally. So there's so much history. And on the other hand, there's a high potential, but there's also so much against taking advantage of what you can do. I mean, how to, to, to make the clubs, the, um, the high performance clubs, uh, the colleges uh, to work together in a way that we really offer opportunities to everybody. How can we have a centralized system in a country that is huge, should we have a centralized system in a country that is huge? How can we empower everybody in a way that we offer opportunities to athletes, but we also offer safety? You know, if you want to commit to rowing over a longer time, then you, you should also have support, not just, you know, um, funding, but also support in how to train, support in how to make a combination of your job and and uh, uh, and rowing, how to integrate your studies into rowing, how to integrate your family into rowing. I've I've coached mothers, you know, who returned after after birth. I brought one mother to the gold. She had uh, Kirsten van der Kolk had a bronze medal in Athens. Uh, became mother in two in two thousand and five. In two thousand eight, she got the gold. So, how is that possible? Yeah, simple. You just make a plan and you stick to the plan. This is why it's interesting to come to the, to the United States because I think I can help. People have to believe. No, they don't have to believe. It should be that, uh, that they understand what I, what I want to do, that they cooperate. And in the end, I want to be judged on my results. And I'm not just talking about medals because medals are for the athletes. I want to be judged that... When we speak again, like let's say in uh, in October, that you say, "Whoa, I didn't expect that you know that we could make such a progress." And again, I don't speak about the medals, but I speak about the system that will be in order and the support, because in the end, people must be convinced that what we are going to do will be the right thing. So, what is my challenge? Yes, what are what are you anticipating the biggest challenges to be? Uh, huh. Nice question. 
the biggest sh uh, challenge is to be clever enough to be uh, constructive instead of uh, destructive. So what is in place? Right, we've got a training center, Princeton. We should empower the training center. What's in place? We've got high performance clubs like uh, California Rowing, Rowing Club, like, I don't know, Boston Rowing Federation. I should know, I know that I should have a complete list, but I don't. Anyway, we should look what can we use, how can we help those structures to fruit. I'm not in competition with nobody. There's so much knowledge in, in, in the States. The colleges, okay, they've got their season, but how can I integrate the college kids in the system? When can I do that? It must be cooperation. So what I must do is I must create a structure that is open and where we can speak to everybody. So I must reach out to CRCA. I must uh, reach out to IRCA. I must reach out to ARCA. I have to, uh, you know, I have to find a way to communicate with people. I don't need um, an ivory tower and I don't need to bring everybody somewhere where they don't want to be. I must be clever and use all the funding, all the, all the, the means that we have and together have the conviction that we should create some bubbles so that we should empower some structures and that we find a way that works in a natural way, not imposed from above, but created from below, together with the people that are there, together with, with the coaches that are there, high performance club coaches, the college coaches. Why are you the best feeder system for all nations in the world? Look at, at, at the number of people recruited eh, from other nations that took part in the Olympics and how many medals they got. So you could say, yeah, maybe we shouldn't take so many foreigners. That's not true, because if I... You don't think that's true? No. <laughs> if, you, if you take the best from other nations, use them to teach, use them as an example, why shouldn't a college coach be allowed to, do, you know, to recruit the best athletes? Because if you look at, take another sport like uh, soccer in Europe, you've got countries like Spain, where when when it was implemented that, you know, that when, when there was the inflation, all the foreigners were going to Spain. In the end, look at what is the best team in the world. It's Spain because their system is filled with talent from other countries. So you can fruit of that. The only thing is it should be bi-directional. So that means you, much, uh, you have to, to find a way to take the lessons of those athletes yeah, and uh, you have to find a way to see what is the difference. We have to model our youth system in a way that we will bring the kids that can compete with the juniors that will uh, 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 from those countries that are drafted. So we have to learn lessons. So what we do, we invest in those foreigners. We have got good races at the highest level, IRA, NCAA. So that's entertaining. And in the end, we have to fruit, take the fruits of that. I love that. So really you you look at that as just being able to elevate the system here by having talent by cultivating it by by being exposed to it that actually having foreign athletes within the US collegiate system is just going to elevate the the American athletes i think that's a great perspective yeah it should that should that's great so you know, I've gotten to speak with you a little bit now as well in your new role as our CHPO with uh, the athletes. And it's really refreshing to me and also just creates so much optimism for, for me as an athlete rep of what this program really can become based on how you're involving the athletes in this process. And the way that you're already in a very early stage working to empower them in, in their own roles. So what does success look like for you outside of that medal count, right? You've mentioned that a few times, and I imagine just the athlete being central to that is a, is a key part of a successful outcome for you. But, but what does that really look like? Okay, build a sustainable system. First about the medal count, I say I don't value myself on the medal count. I know that the outside world will do it. So I know that we will have 
to have some results also because that's important for the athletes. But to me, it would be a success if we bring a full team of athletes that can compete at uh, at finals level, so top six at the Olympics, uh, at least so at least eight to ten boats at top six at the Olympics, plus retain seventy five of those seventy five percent of those athletes for for LA because LA we have to up the count. It should be result plus one every year, every year plus one, plus one medal, plus one crew in the final. So retainment. Building for Paris, being sure that we get medals in Paris is one thing, but taking 75% of those athletes to uh, to LA would even be greater. That would I would see that as as an aim and as 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 a as a measure of success. Do you have strategies in mind for how you're going to retain that talent and how you're going to build on success year over year? I would be rather cocky if I would say that I know it all. I think that we have to look at the context. I think that I must take time to learn the specificity of uh, your system. Uh, yeah, of course, I've got strategies, but it's not one size fits all. It, it's going to be, um, you know, it's it's no confection uh, suit. It's, you know, handmade. So what I think uh, at first, I must um, I must take time to listen, which I'm doing at the same time. Obviously, I have to produce something, but still I'm listening. I intend to make my first visit and I'm envisioning it a kind of a, a tour around America, um, not to do elections, but to, <laughs> to speak, speak to key stakeholders, you know, um, not just in East Coast or uh, West Coast, not just in, in, in uh, San Francisco or Oakland and in Boston or whatever, but I should also be in 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 uh, uh, Seattle. I should always be in uh, Florida. I should go to Texas. I should go to Oklahoma. I must have a plan to visit all those clubs and major in universities. I'm not going going to do that all year round. But this coming period, I'm going to to try and um, fix an as heavy possible travel schedule so I have the time to meet people and to talk and have a better idea. And from there on, we can we can build. Basically, I say, listen, make a plan together, because then it works. If I make it, it's imposed from above. Won't work. If people have the feeling, yeah, the guy is not totally stupid, then it's good. Yep, I love all that, and uh, I'm excited for a lot of these club representatives and coaches to meet you. I think they will, if nothing else, get a real kick out of your dry sense of humor. <laughs> so that will be good. Um, you know, I, I've also heard you speak at, I think it was a conference on just your perspective around physiology and the importance of recovery and really the way you, you integrate training data uh, into a big picture training plan. And so I'm curious to hear in this new role, how one you think about taking some of those tools and and bringing them to the US because in my opinion we're lacking in some of those areas so we could definitely improve on the sports science side and two how how will you do that with coaches while you're not in a, the coaching role i imagine like that will be a close relationship that you'll need to continue to develop yeah what about uh, uh, all the scientific things we can do I strongly believe in quantifiability so that we can measure. Um, but I don't believe in measuring without a plan. So I know that uh, within US rowing, there's not a strong tradition of, uh, of using much equipment. There's also a lack of availability of things. So what is basic? Basic is training. Okay. So the first thing we have to do is to, to, uh, to structureize uh, the way we collect data about training. It's not too difficult. I just will ask people to structureize the way we collect data. We have to talk one language. It should be that if somebody says that he does a training type X, that another people, that other people will understand that. We have to talk one language. We have to design one system of testing, which means it is now kind of, uh, different every time, every coach, etc. how people are uh, doing specific tests. 
I'm not talking about ERK testing, but I'm talking about like step testing, physiological testing, uh, maximal uh, uh, oxygen uptake testing. So, and then you touch another point. And the other point would be, yeah, but you don't have the money for that. So, and correct. That doesn't mean that I don't, that I'm not going to do it. But if I can explain to everybody that on a regular basis, I'm going to provide this and this and this. If people from outside will see that at least now we know what we are going to do next year in March or what we will do in April 2024, I'm, I have no fear whatsoever that funds will be the limitation. But I can't do that without a plan. So I have to explain and I have to agree with the people who have to do that, the coaches, the clubs, the colleges, as far as they're concerned. I have to have a detailed plan that everybody can understand about testing, about training. It's not that I'm going to impose, I'm not going to teach Mike Tati how to, you know, how to prepare a boat for, uh, for a championship. I know he knows that exactly. And there are so many people that will be able to do a good preparation with a boat. However, I think that uh, in the end, to make it accessible for everybody and like me, nobody is forever. So we have to make things for the future. That means it should be, uh, it, it should be a heritage to people, a system not connected to me. So whatever I produce, whatever training plan, whatever system of of, of uh, physiological testing, whatever system of measurement I would want to install, it should be clearly communicated to everybody. It should be clearly communicated why, when, and what you get out of it. It doesn't make sense if I have you do a test, if I put it in a spreadsheet. You don't need data in a spreadsheet. What you need is information. So. This is about testing. This is about everything. This is about, for instance, you're an athlete. I think you, you deserve the right to know how to improve. So if I collect data, I can tell you, okay, your ERG score. I can tell you your lactate levels, but I also can tell you how many times in a year you were injured. Should be interesting for yourself. So we should look at when the training plan worked and when it didn't. So things like that will need a base. So we need, <laughs> there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, there is a lot of work to do and um, I'm excited to, to see it. Okay, well, there's one final question that I've been asked to close out this podcast with that is Amanda's favorite question to end a conversation with. Um, first, I guess I'll position this with, Yossi, do you still get any rowing in? Is that part of your physical activity? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Should I explain? Yes. Okay. Rowing is a physical sport. It's a, a strength endurance sport. Yeah? Yes. Once you get older, sorry, masters. It's, I talk about myself, not about you. Because I get what, uh, somewhat older, my strength goes down. This will impair my technique. Mm -hmm. I might dream that I still row how, uh, the way I rode, but it's not true because I don't have the force that I would need to make the correct motion. And if I don't make the correct motion, I don't get the joy that I got when I was younger. Yep, I understand that. Well, we'll have to get you on a master's strength training program. But um, the question from Amanda was, what's your favorite thing to eat after a row? So I guess you can answer this two ways. Either what was your favorite thing to eat after you used to row or what's your favorite thing to eat after your physical activity of choice now? Yep, my favorite meal that's a that's a tricky one because people think that I'm not taking care of myself very well. Should now I should think of something healthy, but in general I would say a good slice of pizza. But just because I worked for four years in Italy, mm, yeah. So now there's no pizza that can compare to that. <laughs> nope. But to be honest, I will try and bring our team to Italy next uh, spring. So then I catch up. Perfect. You can have lots of pizza and you can introduce them to that as a recovery food. Nah, <laughs> for them, they will, <laughs> for them, it won't do. For old people, it works. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, thank you, Yossi, so much for the time. I'm excited for everyone to hear from you. I'm excited for the work to come. And yeah, please uh, just make yourself at home in the U.S. We, we're excited to have you. I'm really happy to come. Mm -hmm.
And that's all for this episode of The Swing of Things. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Sarah and Yosi as much as I did. Remember to like, share, and follow from wherever you get your podcasts. It helps others to find us. Please subscribe to make sure you don't miss future episodes. And thanks for listening. 